Jesus! What's, what's going on? What do you mean, what's going on? Look, open your eyes, man! Oh, Jesus. Let him have it! When, on the outbreak of war in 1914, the British Expeditionary Force crossed the Channel and marched into Belgium, it did so armed with one of the most iconic rifles of the 20th century. The SMLE, or short magazine Lee Enfield, has now become almost legendary, and the fighting qualities of the men of the BEF the same. It's important to understand, however, that although both rifle and men possessed superior qualities, and were the product of much improvement born from the hard lessons of the Boer War, they must be examined rationally if their true qualities are to be understood. Now there's no doubt that the rifle was of excellent sound design, eminently suitable for modern warfare, especially in Western Europe. And the men of the BEF benefited immensely from the improved training developed in the early 1900s. This was particularly focused on tactical prowess in the field, the use of ground, cover, and surviving on the battlefield. It also included one other significant aspect, musketry. This is perhaps the most often cited quality of the British soldier of 1914 and will be the subject of this video. Well, we eventually got onto this so-called Mons Condé Canal uh, and in extended order, and, and oh, we were three yards apart easily. We just laid there and the bugles were sounding and the bands were playing and these columns of Germans were coming up. You couldn't miss them. And this is why I think they thought they were, we had machine guns because the British Army was absolutely spot on with the rifle. What? I was very proud. And then, oh, well, I saw several chaps killed. And we fought, we, we fired and fired, and until we could, the, the barrels got so hot that you couldn't hold the rifle. And you picked the dead fellow's rifle up and used his till you got your own cooled down. And then the whistle went, retire. Such is the legend of the BEF in 1914. But despite exaggerations and misunderstandings, it's a legend rooted in fact and history. And it's these aspects that we'll explore. The short magazine Lee Enfield, Musketry of 1914, Part 1. In this, the first of four parts, we'll introduce and define the subject. We'll cover musketry of the 19th century and its use during the Boer War. And following this, the challenge of change, musketry developments in the post-Boer War era. The image of the irrepressible Tommy with his SMLE on his shoulder, marching up French and Belgian roads in 1914, only to confront the might of the German army has now become iconic. The rifle and the men forming a combination that created the very foundation of the legendary rapier amongst scythes. Musketry is a two-dimensional discipline. Firstly, it is based on solid, fundamental, individual shooting. The ability of a man to hit his target, whatever the conditions, ranges, and the size that it may be. The second aspect is the skill and ability required to direct by observation, indication, and correction the fire of the group on a point area, linear target, or a moving target, all of varying sizes and speeds. Musketry at the end of the 19th century was very much an evolution of the programs and lessons started 50 years earlier when the army adopted the first general issue rifle for all ranks. In fact, the main difference by the time of the issue of the 1896 musketry instruction was in target size 
due to the increased performance of the 303 magazine rifle. Targetry was still made of iron, and scoring was also very much of a bullseye type. The third, second, and first class targets were all smaller than they had been before, and were used for differing ranges, the first class being the largest target at the farthest distance. The application of musketry was also very much rooted in the past. Individual fire at individual targets, although not a new concept, was now practiced in two ways, both deliberate, in which the man used the rifle as a single loader with the magazine cutoff closed, and rapid, with the cutoff open and the rounds in the magazine used. Collective fire, also known as sectional fire, was practiced by independent and volley fire, both in close order in two ranks and in extended order in a single rank. There were some rudimentary field firing practices in which a section conducted a mock attack between 800 and 300 yards. On the surface, it would seem that musketry standards were acceptable. They were, however, not necessarily indicative of the type of tactics practiced by the battalions of the era. Despite the manuals prescribing extended order with larger intervals and proclaiming that initiative needed to be enshrined on the battlefield, regimental commanders and officers seemingly clung to older concepts and the use of so-called Aldershot tactics, which may have been technically by the book, were not executed in the spirit of the book. The first indication that this type of musketry may not have completely been as effective as possible was on the northwest frontier of India during the Pathan Revolt of 1897. Here, while facing Pathan tribesmen armed with relatively modern weapons, it was found that the tightly controlled, volley-heavy delivery of fire was not as effective against fleeting, somewhat dispersed enemy who hid amongst the rocks and only closed when things were exceptionally in their favor. These lessons were perhaps taken to heart more so by the Indian Army, which, although was a separate entity, was very much a product of the British military establishment, and the British Army in India. The lessons from the Northwest Frontier were juxtaposed the very next year, when the Army inflicted a crushing defeat on the Mahdi and his followers during the reconquest of the Sudan in 1898. This campaign featured as its crowning achievement victory in a battle that seemingly demonstrated the effectiveness of older and somewhat antiquated tactics. The Battle of Omdurman indeed ratified the continued use and effectiveness of tightly controlled massed fire. This false positive reckoning was to have heavy consequences. The overly controlled and pedantic modes of musketry practiced in the 1890s were not sufficient when the British Army met the Boers in 1899. Now, it's very hard to differentiate tactics from musketry, as indeed they are, or rather should be, linked strongly. So when examining the effect of British musketry during the Boer War, one cannot simply assume that many battles were lost due to poor or indifferent rifle fire. Tactical blunders, lack of reconnaissance, and the underestimating of the enemy were amongst the chief causes of the losses of Black Week and other debacles. These were not necessarily put down to simply poor shooting. That said, it was quickly identified that British musketry was indeed substandard. This was partly due to various technical problems with the newer magazine Lee Enfields, which were found to have grievous errors in their factory installed sights, causing wild shooting in deflection and range. It was also seen, however, that the over reliance on tight control, whether in volley or independent fire, hamstrung the men from their initiative to engage targets as they may have been presented. Born from this was the skill that became known as snap shooting. The practice involved waiting at the ready for a target to appear, then quickly aligning the sights and firing in the shortest possible time. This skill had been essentially non-existent before the war. As already mentioned, the Boer War came as a great shock. The opening moves had been disastrous, but with timely adjustment of tactics, the initial setbacks had been overcome and tactical victory was achieved by 1900. With a great deal of effort and hardship on both sides, the war was brought to a conclusion, with the final surrender of the last bands of bitter enders. Almost immediately, reform was instituted in the field of musketry. Instrumental in this shift in paradigm were two men in particular, 
Sir Charles Munro became the commandant of the School of Musketry at Hythe in 1903. He was a veteran of the Boer War, and his experience there shaped his philosophy of future warfare and musketry in particular. He was joined by Norman McMahon, who, as chief instructor from 1905, also shared Monroe's views on what was needed to improve the shooting of the British Army. McMahon's persistence in advocating fire tactics led him to be known as, quote-unquote, the musketry maniac. Amongst the principles that had been found crucial in South Africa was the concept of fire and movement. This, as a principle, had been in existence from well back into the 19th century, but it was in the 20th that this became fully developed. Rapid fire had been a concept ever since the adoption of the magazine rifle in the 1890s, but was only able to be fully realized with the adoption of the SMLE and charger loading. These two tactical aspects, rapid fire and fire and movement, were championed by Monroe, McMahon, and the staff at Hyde. The first changes in the post-Boer War musketry program saw the annual allotment of rounds for training and qualification raised from 143 in 1896 to 300 in 1905. The older 19th century fire discipline was refocused and volley fire was made redundant. Independent fire became the norm. Slow or deliberate fire combined with rapid practices figured prominently. Snap shooting was also introduced as a practice technique with vanishing targets following on from direct experience in South Africa. It's interesting to note, however, that at this early post-war date, there was no rapid practice of over five rounds, although generally the annual qualification reflected much more in the way of tactical shooting skills in the snaps and rapids that had ever been practiced before. Machine guns had also been in service since the 1890s and even before in the form of manually operated versions like the Gatling and Gardner. The fully automatic Maxim gun had been used since the 1890s, but its true power had yet to be realized. Monroe and McMahon saw these weapons as a way to increase firepower on the battlefield and were advocates of their use in increased numbers. McMahon penned a short work entitled Firefighting. This was based on a lecture he gave of the same title in 1907. It focused on the development of firepower, in particular the increased use of machine guns. The army was to deny the acquisition of more machine guns, and this would cause McMahon to famously state, There is only one alternative left to us. We must train every soldier in our army to become a human machine gun. Every man must receive intensive training with his rifle until he can fire with reasonable accuracy 15 rounds a minute. These conditions would cause changes to be made to the musketry program in 1909, McMahon being famously involved in those changes. The number of rounds shot in the annual qualification actually dropped from 300 to 250, but generally the annual qualification that each man had to shoot that was prescribed therein got a great deal harder with higher scores being more difficult to achieve. Many regimental journals of the era attest to this quality. Here, a selection of notes from individual companies of the Highland Light Infantry lament the increased difficulty and the apprehension in shooting this newly introduced musketry course. That said, there was actually a reduction in the ranges that were used. In 1905, the maximum range shot at was 1,000 yards, very much a product of the experience of South Africa, where by 1909 this had shrunk to 600 in light of the perceived realities of possible future warfare closer to home on the continent. Another important change was the inclusion of much more comprehensive rapid-fire practices. These would include rapid reloading, with the aim of achieving the 15 rounds a minute, as stated as a goal by McMahon. During this post-Boer War era, perhaps a product of the new focus on rapid fire, certain expert marksmen were to eventually demonstrate the ultimate, though not necessarily common, capabilities of man and weapon in the form of rapid fire feats of arms. An instructor at the school, Jesse Wallingford, would demonstrate his skill early on in 1908 by shooting 36 rounds into his target at 300 yards. This standalone feat, and undoubtedly similar ones performed by other instructors at Hive, would serve as benchmarks, proving exactly what could be accomplished with an effective man and rifle. Although it won't be covered at this particular point in the series, there will be a complete part 
dedicated to the quote-unquote Mad Minute. Both Monroe and McMahon would go on to command elements of the BEF in 1914. Monroe would be the general officer commanding the 2nd Division, while McMahon was the colonel of the 4th Battalion Royal Fusiliers. McMahon in particular would, in the initial actions of Mons and Le Cateau, be able to see firsthand what his efforts at Hive had achieved, the crushing effect of British rapid fire. Sadly, like so many of his old contemptible brethren. He was killed outside Ypres later in 1914. So this brings us to the end of part one. Part of understanding musketry of 1914 is putting it in the context of what came before. The events, the situations and actions that all contributed to what would ultimately bear fruit in the climactic battles of 1914. In the next part, we'll discuss preliminary musketry training, training aids, targetry, and the use of miniature and the 30 yards range.